Chapter 9, Satan, Demons, and Spiritual Warfare. So this is actually part two in our discussion of chapter 9. And what we discussed in the initial lecture was just angels in general. What is an angel? How do we think about them in, in terms of how they're pictured in scripture, different types or descriptions of angels? And we recognize that they're not a race, but that they are each individual creations from God. We talked about how we should imagine the power of angels and angels in relationship to humans, whether we should think of them as greater or weaker, um, more in a higher in authority or lesser in authority to humanity and so forth. But we did leave out largely of our discussion the reality of fallen angels. And I'll start out here with some, some classic art. Here's an Albrecht Durer woodcut. This is dating to the Reformation era, uh, to my memory, about the 1500s or so. And um, I mean, it, artistically speaking, it's amazing. It's a print, and so he's carved this out and then printed it off and then painting in the colors in between. But just to call attention to what's going on here, the picture is supposed to be of Michael and his angels, and they're doing spiritual battle, this is described in Revelation 12, with Satan and his demons down below. And just a couple of things to highlight, it's interesting, the, the angels above hold weapons, and so they're, they're using some kind of physical implement. You get the impression that they're able to physically do things, and physical or spiritual warfare is a physical type thing. You're also recognizing that the angels are anthropomorphic, they, they look like people. And they're fighting the way that people would fight, with the exception, obviously, of the wings. So that's a significant difference. Then looking down below, you notice the demons and the way that the demons are, per, are portrayed here as kind of reptilian, dragon, serpentine type things. And certainly that fits with some of Scripture's description. Um, scripture will refer to Satan as that dragon. So that, or really that serpent would be a valid translation. So, okay, there's something there. Here's a more, um, a, a more complete painting. This is Raphael. And you're finding here something parallel in terms of subject matter. Um, Michael up above is, in this case, you've got some beauty, like in the wings, the colors and the design of the wings, and even the colors of his clothing. Quite a heroic looking figure, muscular and very much triumphant standing on Satan. Satan down below, in, portrayed here in dark browns, and you get the idea just from those colors and the appearance of, of someone, an individual that's rather sinister. So my question, does this represent the biblical data well? Are these portrayals that we ought to be using or imagining as we think of Satan, demons, and spiritual warfare. And on multiple levels, does this accurately represent Michael? Does this accurately represent, based on what we know from Scripture, a way that we might imagine Satan? And is this a good way to present spiritual warfare, how it would be carried out, what it might primar primarily look like? How does this all work? We can go further. As you talk about different religions, different perspectives on um, Satan, you're going to find a lot of variety here. Something that I hear, I would say more or less in popular discourse, is an, a kind of assumption that because Satan is God's opponent, then Satan is in some way cast as more or less equal with God or parallel to him. And so we end up with something kind of like this. It's God and Satan in the eternal opposition, the great battle that never ends. Labels for this Manichaeism or Zoroastrianism had something like this. And in our own day, if you think something like the yin-yang symbol, or if you're into popular culture, pop culture, you can think of Star Wars, the good side of the force, the bad side of the force. The notion in each one of these frameworks is that good and evil are, are kind of parallel and more or less equal. And the two forces battle back and forth and sometimes you see good winning and sometimes you see evil winning but there's this constant and unending battle is this the way it works does satan have more or less equal ultimacy with god well see that's going to affect the whole the entire way you think of your faith in christianity salvation and what it means to follow god
Here's another framework that's not uncommon. Jehovah's Witnesses understand that Jesus was or is Michael the Archangel. So that when you read about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that is Jesus. When you read about Michael the archangel, that is Jesus. Jesus is kind of, well, could be put into the class or the category of angels. And Jesus and Satan then have more or less equal ultimacy. Underneath God, God is the ultimate. God is the highest. But then Jesus and Satan are peers. Michael and his angels versus Satan and his angels, Jesus versus Satan. Mormonism has a similar structure. Mormonism understands that in the very early prehistory of time, Satan offered to redeem creation and humanity for his own glory. Jesus offered to redeem humanity and creation for the glory of the Father. And so Satan is cast out and Satan is evil and selfish. Jesus is good and gracious. But if you process those out, Jesus and Satan are more or less equals. So is that a good way to think of Satan? And finally, what about this presentation? A presentation where we would talk about God, and I might add in here critically that we should talk about Jesus as God. So we can talk about the Father as God, Jesus as God, the Holy Spirit as God. And then below that, Michael and his angels parallel to Satan and his angels. Is that the way? we ought to be thinking about this diagram. Well, my point in going through some of that introductory information is that I really want you to process and recognize that our view of Satan does have a significant impact on the way that we think about God. Thinking about Satan, thinking about Satan's status, and even then the practicality of how that affects us and how we ought to be viewing Satan. These are important questions important questions that scripture addresses. So I'll start out with this. Let's talk about and recover again what we discussed in respect to angels, what they are, and how we ought to think about angels. Do you remember the diagram that I used before? And it's a diagram I've shown you multiple times before. God up above, below everything else, a strong line across. Angels as part of the subset which is in the everything else. One of the critical and foundational ideas we talked about last time is that angels are created. Angels are all created and they were all created holy. One of the reasons we know this is because we can go back to Genesis and we can just see in the creation of the world, God looks at everything that he had made and he declared that it was very good. In the beginning, all of the angels were good. But of course, something happened. There was some kind of fall, and the result of that fall is that a third of that angelic host is corrupted. Three different passages talk about this. Jude 6 talks about the angels which kept not their first estate, but left that habitation. They're reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the coming judgment. Second Peter talks about God sparing not the angels that send, but he cast them down to hell and he delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved forever to judgment. And Revelation 12 talks about Satan drawing a third part of the stars of heaven and casting them down to the earth. And what follows is then a further description of Satan's opposition to the Messiah, his attempt to try to destroy the Messiah. But in any case, what we've gotten out of those passages is the recognition that the angels were created holy, Jude's language, their first habitation. They were created righteous and beautiful, and it's the choice to sin, specifically linked, apparently, to Satan's sin that brings about this change. When did this happen? Well, apparently we would want to say something between the creation of the world. I would argue that at the end of, end of Genesis 1, God saying that he saw everything that he had made and it was good. Everything he had made is not limited to just the physical creation, I would suggest, but everything he had made. And since he had made everything and he looks at it all and he declares that it's all good, and since angels are part of the category of things that God made, 
then I'm assuming or I'm understanding that at the end of Genesis 1, God is including in that those words that angels are good. Somewhere between there and Genesis 3, when we meet the serpent, the serpent which is Satan, and Satan tempting Eve, somewhere between those two moments, there's a fall or there's a choice to rebel. What did this look like? Well, two common passages that are often talked about are Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. You can look at both of those passages, and there are some interesting details in there that give us the impression maybe these could be referring to Satan. You've got to recognize that in both cases, the passages are on the surface level and on the most explicit level referring to pagan kings that God will judge. So they are at the foundation talking about humans, but whether they have a further kind of implication by comparing those humans to Satan, it's possible. It's just a little hard to say. Passing comment here. It's in one of those passages that we read the language of light bearer or Lucifer. And it's from that and then later it's translation into the words Lucifer that we get the idea or the, the name Lucifer. There's actually not a lot of scripture, I mean, besides that, there's nothing, that connects the name Lucifer to Satan. It's basically dependent on that passage, and that passage is not exactly explicit that it refers to Satan. It's possible, but not absolutely true or absolutely clear. My assumption is I don't think Isaiah 14 probably refers to Satan. I am more open to Ezekiel 28, possibly referring to the fall of Satan, but that's as far as I can go with it, a possibly referring to rather than a full statement of it. We do have one clear statement that gives us a, a strong idea of the fall of Satan. And this is in 1 Timothy 3. It's part of the qualifications for an overseer or you could say a pastor. And one of the cautions that is included in this passage is this statement, not a law, novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Okay, now there are a few possibilities for how to think about that statement. The idea of the passage could be really simple, just the idea that the person would be condemned or destroyed or um, brought into spiritual demise by the devil. So the condemnation that the devil brings about, the devil destroying the person, in the same way that we read Jesus warning Satan, or warning Peter that Satan intends to sift him like wheat, or that Peter later talks about the devil like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, we ought to be wary because the devil does this sort of thing. So it's possible that the reading is just that simple. The idea simply is that the person might fall into the condemnation that the devil would bring about by tempting him and destroying him. But possibly a, an easier reading is that the concept is fall into the condemnation that the devil fell into. And if that's the case, then the concept would be being lifted up with pride. This person would be condemned just like the devil was condemned. And the assumption or implication possibly that the devil's condemnation was pride. And if that's the case, then some of the information would be that Satan lifted himself up, desired more glory than was his rightful due, and because of that, then he was condemned. Now, a couple of things to say about that. Number one, whatever Satan sin, it would be connected to pride. And that's because all sin is interconnected like that. So that essentially any sin is related to unbelief and selfishness and pride and forgetting who God is and misplacing or misunderstanding ourselves in his intentions, his economy, his purposes. Okay, so all of these are connected together and whatever Satan's sin was, it had to involve pride. We should also just caution or include in here for a moment that it in terms of understanding the first sin or where sin came from in the very, very beginning, that's really a discussion that belongs under the problem of evil. But the answer that we discuss there is, we don't know. 
And so we wouldn't want to create any kind of imagined scenario for Satan where out of good intentions or out of the best intentions of his heart, he kind of makes a mistake and then that somehow magically turns to sin. We don't know how Satan went from a good creation of God, holy and right, and how he chose to betray God's goodness to him. We don't know. And that leads me to the next point I would like to make. The various theories that I talked about earlier, some of the scenarios or stories as assumed by Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or even Islam has its own story for how Satan fell. The various stories that are imagined, none of these have support in scripture and critically, we ought to be very careful not to fall into that trap ourselves. What can we say about Satan's sin? What can we say about the fall of Satan and the demons? And ultimately, the answer is we know very little. It seems that it was connected somehow to pride, certainly a rebellion against God and his glory and his sovereignty. But beyond that, it's really hard to say, to give motivations or explanations or a narrative that explains Satan's sin. I would comment here, as I've commented in a few other contexts, if I could give a valid, sensible, understandable reason why Satan sinned, what I would have done is just given a logical reason for sin itself. As though, well, this was a good option and aren't we glad that Satan was being sensible and wise and chose this option. I can't and I won't because by definition, sin doesn't make sense. Sin is insanity. Satan's choice to sin was no exception. Now, Satan's choice to sin, of course, was followed or extended by the demon's choice to sin. And we saw this earlier when we looked at the three passages that talked about the fall of Satan and his demons. We saw that it refers to angels, and here, the angels, plural. And the most explicit passage is Revelation 12, referring to Satan, the dragon, or the serpent. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And within context, there's reason, sensible and plausible reason to believe this referring to demons. So Satan's sin then involves or entraps a third of the heavenly hosts that follow him in his sin and are together condemned. What's interesting then is to move to the present and just process what's going on with demons. Why? Why today are demons continuing in rebellion against God? Do they not understand? Do they, do they not comprehend? Or somehow is their understanding blackened or darkened so that they can't comprehend the reality that they are ultimately going to be condemned? And the answer is apparently uh, uh, no, absolutely not. There is quite a bit of clarity about the reality of all of this. And we have some, some hints of this as well as some explicit statements. In terms of hints, I would just observe, watch the specific language that Satan uses or that the beast and the false prophet use in Revelation and watch the reality that Satan grasps quite well the true theology because he apes it. In other words, he copies, mocks it, and turns it around. You discover that Satan will use language that belongs to God. Language of worship, language of glory, worship, language of kingship. Satan will claim that language for himself, which obviously is a lie. Or you can go to Satan's temptation of Jesus in Matthew 4 and just recognize that Satan's use of these passages is, is or at least the one passage he quotes, is rather clever. And his other temptations are also quite clever uh, to recognize Satan's quite aware. One way of saying this is, I, I have no doubts really that Satan is a better theologian than I. Satan understands theology at least as well and better than we do. Satan understands human nature. Satan understands the nature of what's going on in the world. Satan understands <laughs> The heavenly kingdom, the heavenly court, the presence of God, he's been there. And for thousands of years, he's watched human, human beings struggle with their sin. A couple of passages, though, that state this even more explicitly. So I'm going to go to two, and these are in respect to demons. Let's recognize here this language. They cry out to Jesus as he's coming. This is the demoniac. 
What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come to, tither, to hither to torment us before the time? Um, a couple of comments in here. One, what have we to do with thee is kind of the, what is, what is our connection to you? What, what is our relationship? What's, what's happening here? How are we interacting here? Jesus, thou Son of God, is the recognition that they know his identity. And one of the ironies at this point in Matthew, but also in the other Gospels, is that Jesus' identity is under dispute. I mean, the religious leaders are questioning, who is Jesus? Who is this person? That's one of the central questions of all of the Gospels. The demons know, and the demons state it clearly, supporting, again, my earlier contention, that we should recognize most of the time, the demons are probably doing a better job with theology than we are. Are you come to torment us before the time? And that's an awareness of a concept we'll return back to in a little bit, but it is the, the, the reality or the destiny of the demons. They're going to be put into bondage forever. They're facing hellfire, and they know it. And the basic idea of their words here is, well, don't we still have time? We know that our end is hellfire, but don't we still have more time? James 2.19, you believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. The concept of there being one God, and that's the foundation of, um, the, well, Judaism until the present. But one of the core foundations in the Old Testament, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And that concept, there is only one God, not many gods. Well, the devils, the demons even recognize that. Again, their affirmation of theology is more or less orthodox. It's not a problem of information. So what's going on here? Why, why on earth would you have this kind of reality among the demons that they understand theology or theological realities, and yet they reject it and ignore it? And the answer is that we have biblical support for the insanity of sin and the blindness that comes from it. Okay, multiple passages talk about respecting humans. That humans know the truth about God, Romans 1, but they suppress it. Why? Because of their unrighteousness. Or John 3, this is the condemnation, light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. I think the idea here goes, before we look at demons and say, these, these beings are insane. How could they possibly continue on in rebellion against God when they know their end? Let's just recognize, yes, we humans do some pretty insane things too. And this is a common malady with sin. Sin distorts our thinking and makes us insane. But I'd also recognize one other point, and that, that is that we get the very strong pattern across Scripture that there is apparently no provision of salvation for demons. And if you look across a couple of passages, they're going to support this kind of idea. So Hebrews chapter 2, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, that's one concept that I have to link out several other steps. The context of the statement in Hebrews 2 is talking about Jesus bringing salvation for mankind. And the point here is that Jesus in his incarnation did not take the nature of angels. He does not redeem angels. He did not die for angels. We have another statement that works like this, 2 Peter chapter 2. God spared not the angels that sinned, but he cast them down. And the angels who kept not their first estate are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment. There is in these passages no impression, in fact, the statements really go the other way, of any possibility for angels or demons to repent and return to receive salvation. So I think the explanation here goes that though the demons understand the truth of theology, they understand that God is the sovereign and that God is going to ultimately triumph, sin continues to blind and distort their thinking in insane ways to the extent then that they refuse to repent and there is in them no desire to come. It is not as though the demons are hoping, wishing, begging for salvation and God refuses as much as that they simply don't want it at all. One or two other details I'd like to just point out, and these are in passing for us to understand demons or some of the, the broad information about demons. Here's one. 
you see some interesting insights that give us a sense of how many demons there are. Here, Jesus commands the unclean spirit to come out of the man. And we discover here that this demon is called legion because many devils were entered into him. So we're probably talking here about thousands in one person. Thousands of demons inflicting or afflicting a single man. Um, that's interesting for information that we will return to in the future, just talking about demon possession and spiritual warfare. The other thing I'd like to point out as a passing concept or information point before we move to the doctrine with, of Satan or talking about him, is that the demons we see are only part of the whole. What I mean by that is even if we talk about thousands of demons, we should know that the original creation, all of the angels, is now cut down to one third, that's the demons that fell. Even within that one third of the demons, there's a part of those demons that are immediately imprisoned. And the reason I say that is that we have a couple of passages that do this. Some of them we've already seen several times, but if we string the pieces together, some of it gets a little clearer. God spared not the angels that sinned, but he cast them down to hell and he delivered them into chains of darkness. Well, wait a minute. I thought demons are running around afflicting us now. We just saw in the passage in the Gospels that, yes, they are, at least in some respects, continuing to afflict humanity. Jude 6, the angels who kept not their first estate are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment. So some kind of sense of them immediately being bound. And here in Luke, there's an interesting insight. The demons besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep or the abyss. And this is language that is, I think, also linked to up here, the chains of darkness, the, the bondage that some of these demons are under. So I think the concept here goes, just putting some of these pieces together. When the demons fell, some of the demons are immediately imprisoned in the abyss. They're immediately imprisoned in chains of darkness. They're, if you want to think some uh, the, the darkness like hell or like Hades, some kind of bondage immediately. The others are allowed to go free and afflict humanity. And I'll talk about the reason in just a second. I don't think we would be helped by imagining, well, were some of the demons more evil than others, and so God punished certain ones, and how was he fair? I don't think that's the direction we want to go here. I think the direction we want to go here is taken from a clue that we receive now in Revelation, Revelation chapter 9. The fifth angel saw, sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven. He was given the key of the bottomless pit. He opened the bottomless pit. And out of the smoke came locusts, and they're like scorpions, and they were given to torment humanity. And there's a description that follows after this, but you really get your explanation at the end. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. And when I put all of that together, I think what you're getting here is that there are demons that are put in bondage immediately after their fall, they're not afflicting us now. Only a part of the demons are afflicting us now. Why? My supposition would be this is an expression of the mercy and grace of God. Meaning, Satan and his demons who afflict the world and whom the world more or less gladly accept as their king, whom the world prefer, that's only part of the total horrors that could be inflicted on planet Earth. And I think it's a mercy of God that he took a part of the demons and he immediately locked them up. If God released all the demons on the world, our lot, our condition, our situation would be even worse than it is. What we're facing right now is only part of the demonic horde. God is holding back some of the horror that could be brought upon us by demons. In the end, Revelation, when judgment falls upon the earth, and yes, when humanity calls out and wants Satan as their king, then part of God's answer is, Satan is whom you prefer, to Satan you go. And God releases the full retinue of the demons. God releases them all. So that humanity has, for a time, the experience of just how horrible it could be just how awful Satan's reign really is. And it drives us back to appreciate and understand the grace of God 
that he reserved that for so long from afflicting the world. I'm going to move then from demons to talking specifically about Satan. And just a couple of points here to make about Satan for us to understand. Let's recognize, for starters, that there are multiple biblical descriptions of Satan, multiple different ways of talking about him. So here is, just lifted right out of your notes, some various descriptions that Scripture uses. Satan is also called the devil, meaning slanderer. He's called the serpent. He's called Beelzebub. He's called the evil one or the dragon. He's called the ruler of this world. He's called Belial. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And even he's picturesquely described as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Any of this language is there. Um, other language that comes in, you can just, you just look across scripture. You can see various other descriptions of Satan. But these are the core ones. These are the most common descriptions that we have. You'll notice absent is Lucifer. I explained some of that earlier and how that name developed, but probably not actually one of the direct biblical descriptions or names of Satan. It's also productive to ask what kind of power Satan has. Does he know what I'm thinking right now? Can he put thoughts into my head? Can he influence my feelings, my moods, or my emotions? And is there some kind of interaction like that that's going on? We don't know exactly. We do have some insights. Luke 22 verse 3 talks about Satan entering into Judas. And that being part of the reason that Judas bet betrayed Christ. We also find that Satan filled Ananias' heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. So that standing behind some of Ananias' actions were the pressures of Satan. And practically speaking, we see a very strong illustration of Satan coordinating or orchestrating all kinds of external events in the life of Job, so that Satan is bringing about all kinds of horrors on him. Now, I think we would want to shrink away then from imagining that Satan is behind every evil thought or every temptation or every struggle that comes. We, we don't know. We can't have a way of saying that it's Satan or a demon. It, I can find plenty of, of fallenness in my own heart to explain all of that. But in any case, there is apparently some kind of ability that Satan has, at least certainly with people that give the space in their lives to allow these kinds of things, that Satan has some influence in such people's lives. And ultimately, if we extend this even further, to the time of the end, we discover that Satan is the power behind the beast and the false prophet. So you discover in Revelation 12 to 14 a discussion of the beast and the false prophet as essentially representatives, proxies, puppets for Satan. And Satan together with them using his power and his influence then to control the world. And Satan will, for a time, rule as the pseudo-false king of this world until eventually God punishes him and he is cast into bondage for a thousand years. One last point of this is that Satan will finally revolt after all of that time. He will break out again and rebel against God, God granting or allowing him to be set free for a short period of time. And I think that illustrates what we've talked about earlier, that the blindness of sin and the horror of it is so deep and dark that even after all of the bondage, after all of the battle, all of the, the failure, Satan will return and rebel and revolt once again. But I want to move then to our last major topic, and that's the topic of spiritual warfare. So go back mentally to what I had earlier in the pictures and what we talked about. And just the vision of spiritual warfare with this dramatized, dramatic and, and, and visually impacting kind of picture that you have Satan crushed under the heads of, or under the, the spears and the weapons of these angels, Michael and his archangels fighting back. And so that kind of vision of spiritual warfare has captured the imagination of many. In fact, there are quite a few different books and other resources, videos, where you're going to find all kinds of talk about spiritual warfare. Is this legitimate? Or is this just the imagination of human beings going awry. Well, some of this is actually based on some scripture. A couple of passages that take us in that direction. Um, 
Revelation 12 is going to describe a battle breaking out in heaven. There was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon or the serpent, Satan. The dragon fought and his angels, they prevailed not. And so the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. He was cast out and his angels were cast out with him. That's probably the basis of Durer's woodcut and of Raphael's painting, this Revelation 12 passage of Michael and the angels casting Satan out. But there's more. Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, based on these expressions and how Paul uses them in other places, as well as the context, I think the case is quite strong that what we're talking about here are demonic principalities and powers. And Paul's suggestion, Paul's argument, is that our contest is not against anything physical, but actually against spiritual forces, angels, demons, fallen angels. And that means then that as you and I struggle spiritually, as you and I struggle to try to evangelize or share the gospel with people, as we fight back, there's something darker going on. A little bit later in the passage, you have that again expressed, the concept that you would be able to, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And that is the idea that Satan is not passive. Satan is actively pursuing us. You remember the first Peter passage that our adversary is like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Or Jesus saying to Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. Satan is active and the warfare is real. There's one other passage that is so exotic and exciting and stimulating in just for the imagination. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel says that for three full weeks he was mourning. For three full weeks he didn't eat, he's fasting. Three whole weeks, okay, so he said it three different times. I think I got the idea. So three full weeks, all of this is going on. And finally on the 24th day of the first month, he's standing by the river. He looks, looks up and there's an angel there. And there's a description of the angel that follows. His body is like barrel, his face like the appearance of lightning, the words like the voice of a multitude. Daniel saw the vision and he's amazed. And a hand touches me and he set me upon my knees on the palm of my hands. And the, the angel says to him, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words. Fear not. And remember, how many days was Daniel fasting? Well, three weeks. From the first day that you set thine heart to understand, your words were heard. I'm come for your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for one in 20 days. Oh, that's the three weeks. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me until I remained there with the kings of Persia. So process what you just read. Uh, Daniel prays for three weeks. He prays and begs God for an answer. No answer is forthcoming. And Daniel rightly or well anyway plausibly maybe starts to wonder are my prayers even being heard the angel finally arrives and he says i was sent at the beginning of your prayer three weeks ago and i couldn't come and there was a reason i couldn't come i was withstood by this prince of the kingdom of persia what's that and the answer the solution to this is that michael one of the chief princes came to help me and it was Michael's arrival then that apparently makes the difference. Because Michael comes, then this angel is able to get free and deliver the message. And a little bit later in the chapter, he continues on. I'm going and I'm going to return to fight with the prince of Persia. And also the prince of Greece will also come. And there's none that holds with me or that stands with me in these things but Michael. So what, are, what is this picture? Apparently, there's the prince of the kingdom of Persia, whatever that means, and the prince of the kingdom of Greece, whatever that means, and they are in some way doing battle against this angel, Gabriel, and together with Michael, then the two of them are able to push them away, and, and that has to do with the answer to Daniel's prayer, that because of this invisible battle, something is going on out there, and what is this? Well, in fact, spiritual warfare is quite real. Quite real to the point of us needing to recognize there's a bunch of stuff going on out there that we don't appreciate or understand. That the dr drama and the excitement of some of this at least tells us you don't have any sense 
of all the stuff that's going on. In fact, there's more. There's language used across the New Testament of Satan's relationship to this world. A bunch of passages that use language like this. So Satan is the prince of the power of the air. John 14, Satan is the prince of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, a passage we'll return to later. Satan is the god of this world. Later on, Satan will deceive the whole world. And with these passages, one more, 1 John 5.19, the whole world lies in wickedness, or one translation will say, in the hand of the wicked one. So what's going on with these passages? And the pattern goes, Satan's relationship with the world, again, is anything but neutral. In fact, Satan deceives, actively deceives the world, and the world is ruled over by him, so that as you and I struggle against this world and its opposition, there's something darker than that. It's not just the world in opposition to God, but behind the world stands Satan himself in opposition against God. It's God and Satan. Excuse me, Satan and the world against God and God's people. Well, that's horrifying. The greatest expression of satanic action today is quite specific. And this is another pattern we find. It's recognizing satanic opposition or spiritual warfare connected to false worship. So here's a set of passages that demonstrate that. Here, Deuteronomy 32, verse 15. They forsook God. They lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. Okay, so this is like idolatry. And so, all right, I see this, the nation of Israel, and in their rebellion, they worship idols. Okay, I see that. Verse 17, but they sacrificed unto demons, not to God to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. And, and the impression of this, or the, the statement of this, is that standing behind false gods, we might assume that a false god is just nothing at all, but actually standing behind that false god is a demon. We're talking about demon worship here. You get a little bit later, Psalm 106 has a parallel statement. They sacrifice their sons and daughters to idols. What are these idols? Or to devils. What are these devils? They are idols. To serve an idol is to serve a devil. In 1 Corinthians 10, 20, I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of, demon, cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. And the argument then goes that behind false re religion, it's not just neutral. It's not just a nothing. It's not just people kind of going through some weird motions that make no sense, but there's nothing actually there. There's something much darker. You're talking about demon worship. There are demons behind these false religions. The greatest expression of satanic action today and of spiritual warfare is false worship. One other insight into the nature of spiritual warfare. If you just notice across scripture the pattern of demon activity or demon possession, it's a very common pattern across all of scripture, except it's not. It's really focused in one particular section. Now, you see it in other places, and I, I'm not going to deny that you can follow the theology of Satan and demons all the way through. But the real climax of demon interaction and of this kind of spiritual warfare is focused on one period of human history. Do you know what it is? Though you have some slight little possibilities of maybe demon possession in the case of Saul, King Saul. And you have some things going on in the Old Testament of demon interaction. When you get to the Gospels, it just explodes. And the, the amount of demon activity and demon possession is extraordinarily focused within this narrow band of human history. You get some afterwards in the book of Acts, you get a little bit. And then it just kind of seems to fade out. Of course, the other climactic expression of it is at the end of time. But this central focus on the ministry of Christ is not accidental. And I think what you've got going on here is an illustration of some of the themes I've already talked about. Satan and the demons are not unaware of what God is doing. 
They are aware of who Christ is, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And their reaction to that during the time of Christ is an explosion of activity, I would argue, essentially trying to stop what God is doing. A pattern that stretches all the way back to Genesis 3, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and the pattern that through all of human history, Satan and his demons step in to to try to stop the direction of the Messiah and his seed, the direction of God's work in the Messiah, the seed of the woman. And that history stretches all the way across the Bible until you get to the Gospels where it climaxes. It's telling you something about spiritual warfare. Now, I want to back up a little bit then, because what I've emphasized here strongly is that spiritual warfare is real, it's significant, it's a very, very important concept to pay attention to. But I'm going to recognize here, on the other hand, that we could go too far. Do you remember, remember the Daniel 10 passage? And you had the prince, the king of Persia and Greece, and then there's battle between these angels and these demons. It's all very exciting, riveting stuff. You could look at that and start imagining all kinds of other ideas. You could create stories and books and movies. Oh, it's already been done. Around this kind of passage or this kind of insight. One point I'd like to make here is that the information leaves us with more questions than answers. In other words, when I read Daniel 10, there's certain things I can say. The passage means certain things. And so I can look at it and say, this points me that direction. Aha, this gives me this insight. Ah, I learned this from this. But I don't really have a full and complete answer about what is spiritual warfare or how it works, do I? I mean, I, I come away with a lot of questions. Who is this king of Persia? And if I have two demons and two angels, is that equal? And how do they do their battle? And do they use physical-ish type swords and weapons like I saw in the pictures? Or See, I don't know. And I think what's going on in a passage like Daniel 10 is that God is giving you just enough information to realize that spiritual warfare is real and serious, but that you ought to just trust God for dealing with it. In other words, one of the things I'll talk about in a moment is that we have no pattern for how to go out and do the spiritual warfare or how to grab up our spiritual swords. The basic concept just goes that there's a lot going on out there and you wouldn't even want to know all of the stuff that's going on. You're gonna to need to trust God. For the, as the one who is con, in control of all of these things. Some then of the information we can say about how we might do spiritual warfare. If you ask something like, okay, well, since I don't know what's going on, how do I do it? Where would I get started in order to do spiritual warfare or to do it effectively and to do it right? Watch what happens when people get obsessed with this topic. And there's a lot of kind of magic words and incantations and commanding in the name of Jesus or by the blood of Jesus and this kind of thing. And, you know, the truth is, Scripture never gives us a pattern for how we should cast out demons. Scripture never gives us a set of statements or use these magic words or if you say this with a loud voice and you scream, something's going to happen. In fact, you see patterns more like this, 2 Peter 2 People that claim to have power over angels are presumptuous. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities, probably referring to angelic powers. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusations against them before the Lord. These people don't know what they're doing and they think that by screaming or laying their hands or yelling some magic words, they're able to cast out demons. And the truth is, they don't know what they're doing at all. Jude 9, even Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. And both of these passages, 2 Peter and Jude, are addressing false teachers and common false teaching to say, here are some of the ways that people's thinking gets perverted, twisted, until they start doing stuff like this. Dare we say, but we should say, that in our own time, people that go out and proclaim methods of doing spiritual warfare by yelling things and so forth are exactly the parallel to some of this. They should not be daring presumptuously to try to do battle with things they don't understand. 
Another example that just makes me laugh is Acts 19.15. Uh, someone goes and tries to cast out an evil spirit. The person doesn't know what they're doing. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> And some of what we've got then when people go out and start doing these kinds of things without knowing what scripture actually says, it's an exact parallel to this. Since scripture never gives us a script, it never gives us a set of words to say, or here's how to cast out a demon, number one, place your hand on the person, and then number two, in a very loud voice with an intense expression, yell the following words. Since there is nothing like that, how do we do spiritual warfare? You may have thought a moment ago when I mentioned taking up a sword of Ephesians 6. Go back to Ephesians 6, the spiritual armor. How do we do spiritual warfare? Read your Bible. Pray love God, fight sin, hate sin, do what's right. The way you do spiritual warfare is the same way that you grow and follow and serve God. Let's talk then finally about the end of Satan and the conclusion of all of this. The end of Satan is quite clear, and the biblical statements tell us where he's going to end. There is no question about this. His destiny is assured. Satan faces eternal fire that was prepared for him. Revelation 20.10, the devil was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, one striking thing of Revelation 20 is that when it comes around down to this final battle, it isn't as though the only person who can conquer Satan is God. In fact, quite, quite on the contrary, God's control of Satan is just absolute. And God says to one of his angels to go. One of the angels goes and binds Satan. When God speaks and God is determined to accomplish something, it's done. It's finished. Similar to that, we see an insight in the book of Job, where God grants to Satan exactly what Satan is allowed to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Satan's end is assured. It's not in doubt. And that's because of another extremely important pattern in thinking about Satan and the demons. In fact, I would argue this is maybe the most important idea to know and remember about Satan. And that is that Satan and his demons have already been conquered by the power of the cross. A long string of passages that show us this. It was prophesied, Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would bruise his head. You would bruise his heel, but actually even the language here is probably that the seed of the woman would crush his head. And the idea then being that when Jesus comes, Satan's power will be crushed. Colossians 2.15, Jesus Christ spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. The idea is of a great military general or leader, and he steps forward, he has conquered, and it's done. He comes out victorious. John 12.31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Well, that's in the context just before Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Here it comes. Here is the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will judge because the prince of this world is judged. Ephesians 1, the exceeding greatness of God's power, which he brought about far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. If you keep on going in the context right after this, you're going to read about the God of this world or his power, but right before it, Paul has just said, yes, and Jesus has already triumphed over that power. Hebrews 2.14 talks about Jesus bringing about through death the destruction of the devil. 1 John 3.6, we have, or 3.8, here is our confidence that the devil sins from the beginning, but the purpose of God, the Son of God, was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Romans 16, the God of peace will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And you are of God and little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Around devils and demons and spirits, particularly in some animist contexts, this is a very frightening thing. People live in fear and it controls their thinking because they're imagining all kinds of demons and horrifying realities. And the answer to that, it is so critical, is to help them understand. There's a very simple solution here. Jesus has conquered that. The devils and the demons are real. 
but Jesus has conquered. In the meantime, scripture does tell us to be sober. So it's not as though we laugh at all of this. Here, the passage we've looked at several times, even Michael the archangel dared not bring a railing accusation. And one of the clearest passages is 1 Peter, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. It's real. You ought to be sober. You ought to be vigilant. You ought to be careful. Ephesians 6, you ought to take on the armor. You ought to fight. And the way you do that is by growing in the graces, the disciplines, in walking with God. Grow and love him more. Do not view any of this as a joke. It's real. It's powerful. It's scary. If you are not walking with God. And some of the theology that we, that we have discussed here with demons and Satan, if you stand alone, you ought to be afraid. But here's the beauty of it. You don't stand alone. Jesus Christ has conquered. The power of Satan is already broken. Think of him like a serpent whose head is crushed. And at this point, though the head is broken, the body still moves. You know how serpents do. Cut off the head and the body will still move. There's still some life in there. There's still some struggle in there. But it's done. There's no chance of a long life for Satan. It's done. The victory has been won. Now, how do you have confidence in light of that victory? You walk with God. You abide in the Holy One. You know and you follow Jesus Christ and be faithful to him. And in that is spiritual warfare and spiritual victory. We ought to be sober. We ought to be vigilant. We have nothing to fear because Jesus Christ, our King, has conquered Satan. And in that lies our hope.